But I can tell you what motivates and drives me, what keeps me up at night and what gets me up in the morning is I don't want any other individual to have a life lost. I absolutely refuse for someone to live the pain and the trauma that I live through. And if I can add my voice to unmuting other voices, if I can add my voice to adding more seats at the table, and that we lift up not just the health of our communities, but we focus on the disinvestment in our communities that is contributing to several of these inequities and disparities in all of that. Welcome to Moments Move Us, a people first podcast, unlocking the power of meaningful moments by bringing you stories that inspire. I'm your host, Rebecca Corin. Today, I am delighted and honored to welcome the esteemed Dr. Erica Steed, Chief Executive Officer and President at the Metro Health System. In this episode, Dr. Steed shares how we can and should embrace technology to revolutionize our industry in order to reach and uplift communities. She stresses the importance of focusing on areas that impact social determinants of health for all and why they are so very critical. Today, Dr. Steed shares with us her own personal story of her health battles and heartbreaking losses within a fractured healthcare system. And we'll see the immeasurable power of personal experience as it creates the fire to launch a transformative journey. Dr. Steed showcases the extraordinary impact one individual can make in dismantling healthcare inequities. And under her leadership, Metro Health is paving the way. Before we dive in, as you hear Dr. Steed, remember that every triumph, every innovation, every setback, and every ounce of determination can ignite change. Dr. Steed's story will inspire you. Let's dive in. So Dr. Steed, you are a true trailblazer. You are the first nurse to ever be in your position. You are the first woman of color, the first woman to ever be in your role as CEO at Metro Health. Wow. Like chills from even just saying that out loud. I just want to take a moment and take that in. The impact of something like that is not lost on me. Can you share a little bit about what that means to you? Honestly, it brings me to tears when I actually think about it. It certainly is the impact of a tsunami-like wave that has been brought to Northeast Ohio and has been brought to Cuyahoga County and has been brought to Greater Cleveland. I'm absolutely proud and I'm still pinching myself at the reality that history has been made at this level. Our organization has been in existence for almost 200 years and it's taken almost 200 years for a female, for a person of color, for a nurse to be positioned in such a powerful role. But it also for me is a wake up call that I need to take on the responsibility of ensuring that I'm not the last, so I may be the first, but I have a responsibility weighted on my shoulders. And that actually, that responsibility is pushing me to really lean down and lift other people up and widen the front door much wider for those who are to follow and to ensure that the path is less windy and certainly less rocky and certainly has less obstacles or no obstacles at all to raise up to this particular level. So what I feel is the impact that is being made, the message that it sends, and most certainly the inspiration that it gives others that if you can see it, you can be it. For me, I am proud to be able to serve in a position where I can make that much of a difference. I love how you said that. If you can see it, you can be it. Representation matters. It matters to see someone like you in this role. So you mentioned your path and how it's a bit windy and I'm sure lots of bumps along the way. Can we start in the beginning with a little bit about your family? Because I know that influences you a lot in who you are today as a leader. Absolutely. And I often get asked the question about Tell me about yourself. Tell me about little Erica. Tell me about how you've come to be and how you transcended into a role like this and answer the question instead of 
talking about me first, I have to talk about my history. I have to talk about the legacy. In short, I come through multiple generations of nursing in my family. So it goes back to my great grandmother who was self-made. This was well before nursing schools actually existed, but she made herself into something from nothing. She was a nurse midwife delivering babies in a small town, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And from there, I can tell you that a seed was planted, it was watered, it was nurtured, it blossomed. It really influenced all the women in my family. So I had the great pleasure, before I can even properly walk and talk, I knew I was surrounded by powerhouses. I knew I was surrounded by trailblazers. I was surrounded by such influential people that didn't just walk on paths. They created the path that people walked on. And they created such a legacy in my family where it inspired family members. And it inspired me most certainly. So my late grandmother, my late mother were also nurses. And instead of having traditional conversations around the dinner table, I learned everything that there needs to know about healthcare and about practicing care delivery at its best and putting people at the center of everything that you do and leading with compassion and humility and putting yourself in other people's shoes. And I can most definitely say that as a five-year-old, I was absolutely expert in a subject matter expert in healthcare. So I can speak the language of healthcare as a five-year-old. I also come from a long line on my father's side of self-made entrepreneurs. And I'm extremely fortunate to have been put in a position where I can marry both of those worlds, put those together. And I've carved out a special place in this world just for me. And I can tell you, as long as I can walk and talk, I've always carried around that perpetual briefcase because I knew I was going to be in a position of influence and make a difference. I just didn't know what world it was going to be, but I knew at five years old that I was going to be someone. And I so happened to come from a family that inspired me, motivated me, nurtured me, supported every single dream that I've had and really helped to shape a path where I can trailblaze. I can open doors for other people and I can pay it forward, which is what I've done from my very beginning. When you think about that perpetual briefcase, as you said, and you think about your role now and healthcare as it stands today, tell me a little bit about where you want to make your impact. As I really started in my role, even well before this, I share a story about not just my upbringing in my early years, but I actually talk about some significant milestones in my life that were very tragic and unfortunate that changed the optics and it certainly changed the trajectory in my journey. So I chose to follow in my family's footsteps and attain my degree in nursing and go into nursing. But very shortly after I attained my undergraduate degree in nursing, I lost my mother. 46 years old when she passed away. I was 23 years old. After going through a series of unfortunate experiences where she was misdiagnosed twice for what turned out to be a very rare form of leukemia, but I had a front row seat view on what a broken healthcare system actually looks like. I had a front row seat view of what delayed care looks like. I had a front row seat view on what it looks like when family members and the patient is not properly engaged in the care delivery process. I had a front row seat view on what it looks like to navigate a maze of health, a lack of coordinated health care. I had a front row seat to the result of an experimental treatment that stole my mother's life, not elongated it or added joy to it. That did something to me at a very early age when I was just trying to discover who I was as a human being and as an individual. I certainly had to grow up fast. And my pain influenced my trajectory where I went into a hyper overdrive with the pursuit to fix what I felt was fundamentally broken and certainly not positioned for a young aspiring leader in this healthcare space. But fast forward after many experiences, and again, I was in hyper overdrive, really leading through mourning is what I was doing. 
So I was ignoring every single obstacle that you would normally see. I had blinders on for that. I jumped and leaned right in. I took calculated risks. I would go after roles that I most certainly was not qualified for, but it opened the door and opened a pathway in my pursuit to answer unsolved questions and the mystery of how I lost my mother at such an unfortunate young age. But fast forward through those experiences, I had to relive that nightmare over and over again through a variety of other family members who also experienced what I would consider to be health inequity. Both my grandmothers, my maternal and paternal grandmothers, died too young from breast cancer. One of my grandmothers actually was also misdiagnosed and also mistreated and also delayed in their care. By the time the cancer was discovered, it ravaged her body. And I had to witness and actually navigate through that journey where I was asking so many questions about how can this happen to me again and again. Just a little bit over a year ago, I lost my younger sister also to breast cancer. So both of my grandmothers died of breast cancer. My younger sister died of breast cancer. But she tried to pursue health care at its best and was denied a basic screening that I know would have saved her life. And fast forward, she lost her life at 39 years old. And I myself, I'm a survivor and I've been brought back. I firmly believe this, that I've been brought back from knocking on death's door to be able to fix the brokenness of this horrific healthcare system and to ensure that no one else has to suffer the pain that I've had to suffer and no one else has to be tragically influenced by what this healthcare system can do for you. So that certainly has shaped me and has influenced me and I've turned that pain into passion and I've turned that passion into purpose. And that's exactly why I do what I do And that pain and passion and purpose and what you talked about earlier, how you have pretty much run through walls in your journey, fueled by that pain in the beginning, that takes you in a way that no one else can be propelled the same way because it's your family, it's your story. And I am heartbroken to hear about all of this loss that is senseless and it's unfair and it's wrong. And when you think about the tragedy that exists from our healthcare system, the equity access, all of these things, you think about when it comes down to it, it's people, it's your sister, your mom, it's you. It's so personal. Everyone, I think, can relate to the personal level of healthcare. And one thing that I am just so inspired by you around is how you just took all that in and continue to put your head down and just drive forward because you will not accept this reality. Can you talk a little bit about what that's like? This is not an easy problem to solve. Absolutely. And I can tell you, rewind 20 plus years ago, I was living off of the fumes of pain. That's what I was, I had blinders on. I was just jumping right in. But now I'm extremely intentional. And I can tell you that when I had blinders on, I was not even paying attention to all of the adversity that I was faced with by being a female, by being a person of color, attempting to rise in a space so I can perfect and to help to problem solve. But I can tell you what motivates and drives me, what keeps me up at night and what gets me up in the morning is I don't want any other individual to have a life lost. Tori Bowie, the U.S. gold medalist Olympian, just passed away, unfortunately, to the same condition that I survived twice. And I can't tell you why I'm here today talking and breathing. I can't tell you why my life was spared. But I can tell you that what I'm doing with it is I absolutely refuse for someone to live the pain and the trauma that I lived through. And if I can add my voice to unmuting other voices, if I can add my voice to adding more seats at the table, if I can add my voice to ensuring that we laser focus, not just within the four walls of healthcare systems, but laser focus on the 80% impact that exists outside of the walls. And that we lift up not just the health of our communities, but we focus on the disinvestment in our communities that is contributing to several of these inequities and disparities and all of that. But I am absolutely a woman on a mission to reverse 
the history and the centuries of inequity that we've had. And I'm a woman on a mission to ensure that no one else has to go through what I've had to go through. And a woman on a mission to ensure that I use my testimony and my lived experience to build a sense of trust in the communities that we serve and to wrap my arms around all of the various communities that have been unheard to make sure that they hear me out loud and clear that they have an advocate pushing for them. Let's talk about unmuting voices and how important that is. And what you were just talking about, unlocking the community voice and bringing them into the conversation, helping empower them to come up with solutions for them. Can you share a little bit about the work to activate your communities and what can other health systems learn from that? I think you hit the nail right on the head. I can tell you a story about everything that I'm doing is me living my life in reverse if I were to go back into a time capsule. And actually, I play these stories out in my head. So everything that I'm doing is because I felt this exact same way. I felt invisible. I felt muted. I felt like I had no voice. I felt like I had no seat at the table. And when I did have a seat at the table, I felt like I was walked over. I felt like my voice was not properly heard. I felt like I could not find myself in the hollow core of a cocoon that I was because I couldn't find it. So everything that I'm doing, I'm playing that tape back. And then I'm trying to have a do-over in my own life for the communities that I serve. I actually started in my role a month early and hit the ground sprinting in roller skates. I enlisted healthy conversations with the community. And I've had these healthy conversations, not only with the external community around us, but also with the internal community. And the intention was simply this. I wanted to build a sense of trust. I wanted to ensure that the community heard loud and clear that they need something and that someone had their back and someone was advocating for them. Someone who was a part of the community, for the community, with the community. And I didn't want to just do things to the community without their voice included. So I've had these conversations as well to ensure that I hear loud and clear that I open myself up to allow the community to put all of the problems on the table. Let me shoulder that pain you've been experiencing. Let's work together to be a part of the solution. And then moreover, I've made those conversations permanent through a series of community advisory councils. I'm creating these community advisory councils where I have an endless number of seats at the table for the community to really be a part of an extension of our organization, really make a difference in a profound way. So these community advisory councils are for the community to be heard, for us to listen, for us to learn, for us to build that sense of trust, to open up a two-way conversation, for us to enlist them and to recruit them to be a part of those solutions that we're absolutely developing. Also, as part of the community advisory councils, I've set a platform for recruitment directly from the communities, directly from the zip codes that often are unheard because I want to invest directly into the community. So I'm promoting lifting up both the health and the wealth. So if I'm investing in people directly in the community that speaks the language of the community, guess what? That's half the battle right there. I just broke down that wall of distrust. I just opened up a liaison to be able to connect the dots. And I've created a platform for us to problem solve real time and address some of these various solutions. That's half the battle. And that is something that has not been done at the scale that I'm doing. So when this is all said and done, I'm going to have hundreds of community health workers planted in the neighborhoods, from the neighborhood that can translate the language of the neighborhood directly in those communities. And then to your point, you made a very profound point about representation matter, and it absolutely does. And I say this as being less than 1% of the country looks like me, being a person of color, a female, a nurse. And then it gets even narrower when you're talking about individuals running $2 billion healthcare systems. Representation absolutely matters. Just imagine the power we can make and the difference we can make 
if we raise that less than 1% number to 10%, translates to 10% of progress against eradicating healthcare disparities and zeroing out the death gap. Well said. And I feel like it is so empowering to hear about how communities that you're creating these advisory councils that have an endless number of seats at the table. We're not talking about one advisory council with the community that's representative of that has maybe millions of people in the community. And there are seven people that sit on a council. We're talking about thousands of people, then hundreds of these community health representatives. It is a totally different way of listening to the community. Absolutely. And it's a different way of infecting in a positive way because one voice amplifies another and another and another. I'm creating a purposeful and intentional domino effect. One of the things you guys are doing, which just really excites me, I am the daughter of two educators. And so I love this and I'd love you to talk a little bit about it. Let's talk about the hidden gem of the first and only high school living inside of your hospital and what that means and how you see that as part of this work. Yeah. Another thing that I'm so proud of, and you don't get many opportunities to boast and brag enough, but I want to put this on a pedestal. We are the first and currently the only, but I'm going to do something about that. High school in a hospital across the United States. With that being said, there's so much value that we're bringing. We're starting early. Our goal is to start further upstream. And by the way, I think we need to go beyond high school. Let's start to plant these seeds in kindergarten. Because again, going back to my early comments, I knew I was going to make a difference at five years old. Imagine if you can influence a five-year-old. Absolutely. Think about your fourth generation, Dr. Steed. Think about all the healthcare workers in your system that have little children running around getting influence. Absolutely. But with this being said, I'm so amazed at this high school in the hospital because many of these students, by the way, they're the head of their family. They come from nine different countries. They get the opportunity where 100% of them get to graduate with a pathway forward, we're, we're giving them a head start on life. We're giving them a head start on being able to go back and take care of their families in other countries or wherever they are. We're giving them an opportunity to make a profound influence well before they even graduate from high school. We get an opportunity to help to produce and mold and shape the future physicians of the world, the future nurses of the world. And many of them, by the way, they graduate with their state certified nurses assistant program. They graduate being community health workers because guess what? They speak that language. They can connect those dots. They can translate all of the opportunities that I'm talking about. And most definitely, these students get to volunteer. They get to be exposed. They get to be mentored. They get to be sponsored. They get to be lifted from leaders like myself who simply just want to lift the community. So it goes above and beyond from speaking to innovation and really being able to build a workforce pipeline that is innovative. It most definitely speaks the language on really addressing a lot of these healthcare inequities that I'm actually talking about. But this is just one of those various anchors. And my personal goal is to take this beyond one and infect all of the communities with the same type of pathway, the same spirit of encouragement that we're actually doing for that. When I think about you, I think about equity and innovation and how when those two things are brought together, there is opportunity that can unlock real change. And it excites me so much. Can you talk a little bit about innovation some of the things that you guys are doing at Metro Health and the things that you feel like, and I love how you said, we're the first high school right now. You're like, I don't want us to be the only, we need more of that. Share a little bit. We have a lot of healthcare execs who listen to this and aspiring leaders. So I think that innovation and health equity, their hand in glove is really the pill hidden in the applesauce, if you will. So I can't think about health equity without thinking about ways for us to really innovate differently and we have always embraced, for example, technological means to really 
keep our community where they are and allow us to come to you as opposed to you having to come to us. So digitization and technology allows us to do that. Innovation allows us to do that. And even these examples that I've already shared, it is all twisted with innovation as well. Another thing that we've done on the innovation side, I have a couple examples. One is I consider us to be more than just a healthcare system. We're more than just a hospital. And we've tapped in and we've created opportunities to incubate ideas and incubate new business concepts to solve problems. We use our breadth and depth of research in profound ways where we're not just trying to address healthcare related challenges, but we're looking at how do we impact the social determinants of health that oftentimes has a greater impact and influence on our patients than not. And how do we use technology to solve for that? So one of the product lines that we incubated homegrown within our four walls is a virtual digital first concept of addressing patient access barriers that's part and parcel some a lot of the problem that we're seeing where individuals are showing up inadvertently in the emergency department when it's far too late because we can't figure out a way to access them. So we've created a very personalized solution to accessing our patients where they are and not just addressing the chronic conditions that they're suffering from, but also allowing us a vehicle to address those social determinants and how do we address the food insecurity, the housing insecurity, the transportation barriers all at the same time through that personalized connection. So that's just one key example, this virtual platform that we've helped to create and shape that allows us to address those access barriers in a fundamental type of way. Another core example is we are the first safety net healthcare system across the country to have our own vector lab where it helps to produce and it is a contributor for cancer care and cancer research. We actually produce our own sources of treatment and therapy for patients suffering from cancer, which is a heavy diagnosis in our various communities. That's absolutely out of the box innovative, being the being first and hopefully inspiring others to, for us not to be the last organization to embrace innovation in that way. You've never been afraid to be the first, have you, Dr. Steve? Absolutely not. And actually it goes way back again, my family history set a pathway for me not to be fearful of leaning in and jumping right in. And again, many people take the road most track. My family inspired me to create my own path. So being first is just goes along with the territory. There you go. I don't know if I would want to be at family game night at the Steeds. <laughs> we are most certainly competitive. I bet in the best way possible. <laughs> Dr. Steed, as we kind of look to wrap up, and I know that there's probably so many things that you could share, but the Moments Move Us podcast was really inspired by stories of people when they have felt seen in a new way for the first time or in a way that set them on a trajectory. Of course, you have this amazing history and family of generational passing along of the wealth and the inspiration of the love of caring for other people, as well as the entrepreneurial side. May I ask, can you share a time when you felt like I am on the right path? This is the moment I've always known. You've always been running forward towards your goals, not letting any no's get in your way. Has there been a moment where you're like, this is why I'm here. This is the moment. Oh my God, I think I have so many examples where I feel validated in my path, but I can say the role that I had prior to this one, I was also a first and I have many roles where I actually was the first and the only, but a particular time and moment that stands out is a part of this when I'm born and raised in Chicago. I was working for an organization very comparable to my current organization at Metro Health that really aspired to be the best and to be the national model in health equity. 
where I was the first appointed president of their flagship. I was the first appointed system chief operating officer. I was the first person of color, first woman, all of these accomplishments. But not only did I inherit an opportunity where I, I certainly believed in the mission, I believed in what we were doing on eradicating healthcare disparities and reversing all of the various wrongs. I also was put in a position where I was given a significant challenge because the organization was certainly at risk of surviving. And this was well before we, its very nature, its very existence was being challenged because it was financially distraught and it was going through a period where it never felt this level of financial constraint before. And as a leader, I was being put in a position not only to continue the mission to serve the community, not only to push the organization forward to drive health equity, I was also put in a position to save the mission in its very existence. I knew at that very moment I was put on this earth for a reason and it was validated. So my purpose was validated then. And I felt through the accomplishment of being able to turn that organization around. And that was a $300 million turnaround in less than a two-year period of time that was nationally recognized. I knew that I was in the right job and I knew I was on the right path. And I knew that this mission that I was on ever since I was 23 years old, it meant something to me. And I was on to something. You certainly are. You certainly are onto something. And I just want to repeat something that you shared in the beginning of this, where you shared that these folks in your family and in your background, they didn't just walk on paths. They created the paths that people walked on. And that's exactly what you're doing. So I just want to thank you so much because... We look up to people like you, Dr. Steed, who are showing us that we can be ourselves authentically and run like hell to our mission and try to accomplish it. So thank you so much for being on the show. Is there anything else you wanted to share with our listeners? As a woman, I just wanted to just make a few comments. I'm absolutely proud of you for opening up this channel and opening up this platform to be heard and to unmute the muted and give a voice to the voiceless and to provide a seat at the table. So I just wanted to share that I'm so thankful and appreciative to you. And I'm actually motivated by the platform that you're creating for that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Steed. I'm Rebecca Corin. Thanks for listening to Moments Move Us. Remember, when you put people first, Your actions can move others in unexpected ways. Be sure to follow wherever you get your audio.